Today's scripture reading will be John 15, verses 4 through 11. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my, my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the Lord's word for us today. You may be seated. Uh, we're exploring in this series, Neighborhood Church, uh, who we are as a church, uh, who God is calling us to be, who we need to be, and what kind of the mission and purpose is for us gathering here in this building, as cold as it is, on this Sunday in 2024 and beyond. And uh, last week, I gave you three phrases that we used to describe kind of our mission, our purpose, our identity as a church. Uh, the first was Jesus-centered. Uh, which meant that we wanted to start and end with Jesus. We want to read the Bible with Jesus as the center. We want him to be the template or the, the picture for what the life is that we're called to live as his disciples or his students uh, living life his way. Uh, the second phrase was disciple-making. Uh, the idea behind that was that we wanted to be a church that doesn't just kind of create a space for people to come uh, experience or consume a religious or spiritual event, but to teach people how to follow Jesus in their everyday life. Uh, to be a student of his way, uh, to live life in his way. Uh, the third phrase is neighborhood focused. Uh, and this is as we were planting this church a couple years ago, this is how we communicated and explained, hey, this is what Wingfoot Church is going to be all about. Uh, we want to be focused on a neighborhood, and that neighborhood is this one, Goodyear Heights, uh, that we are currently in the geographic center of. Uh, that is south of Talmadge Avenue, west of 91 Darrell Road, north of 76 and east of Route 8, if you're curious what we are talking about. Now, when we say neighborhood focus, just a couple things that I want you to hear uh, by what we mean by that. What we don't mean by that is that you have to live in our neighborhood to belong to our church, or that if you don't live in our neighborhood, uh, you are somehow like less of a member of our church. That's not what neighborhood focus means. Uh, what neighborhood focus means is that we want to be a church that is good news for Goodyear Heights. We want to be a community that when people think of Wingfoot Church, when they engage with Wingfoot Church, when they bump up against someone who goes to Wingfoot Church, they think, that's good news. So that we are so connected and ingrained in the life of this community uh, that people who may have no interest in the way of Jesus whatsoever can say, you know what, there's something about Jesus that I see in that church. Uh, that also means that we want to be accessible and understandable to anyone who lives within three or four miles of this church. Accessible, meaning that they can come in and feel like it's a church that understands them and that they can understand, using language and, and, and asking the questions that they're asking as well. That's what it means to be a neighborhood-focused church. And last week, we looked at how Jesus sent his church. He said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Jesus was sent to us to be with us. And so a neighborhood church is with people, not just doing things for them, and not just asking them to come to us, but we are with people. Now, if you're like me, uh, after last week, you probably left, and you have a long list of things in your mind that you're supposed to do, right? I even gave you a, a little card that said, hey, bless your neighbor, and there's like all these things that you're supposed to do. Right? Really quickly, when we started thinking about, okay, what does the mission of Jesus mean? How do I follow him? What does it mean to be sent? Uh, like, there's a whole list of, man, I got to do like these kind of outreaches, are we going to need to do like 17 block parties this year? Or you're thinking about your neighborhood and like just if you like stand on your driveway and you look around, there's like eight or nine families. And each of those families has a story and there's like life and there's hard things. Like there's just a lot 
that when you start thinking about following the mission of Jesus, it becomes very easy to feel overwhelmed and to feel like, man, my, my life is full, my calendar is full. How am I supposed to do this? Uh, and what we're going to look at this morning is that there are lots of good things that we could do as a church. Right? There's an endless list of things that we could do as a church, as a community. There's an endless list of things that you could do to follow the mission of Jesus and to reach your neighbors. But it is possible to do a lot of good and yet miss the most important thing. It's possible to do a lot of good things. And there are lots of folks doing lots of good things in our neighborhood and in our city. But it is possible to do a long list of good things and yet do them for the wrong reasons and do them from the wrong starting point. And that's what we're going to look at this morning because Jesus says to be a fruitful church, we must be a church that abides. Not a church that does lots of activities or that does lots of programs. To be a fruitful church, he says, we must abide. Look at verse 4 of Jesus' teaching here. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, the vine and the branches image is a little bit foreign to us, right? Because when I hear branch, I think tree branch. And when I hear vine, I think that really annoying weed that just will not leave my yard alone. But that's not their idea of a vine and a branch. The vine is like the trunk. It's the thing that connects the thing to the soil and to the nutrients and to the water. And the branch is then the thing that comes off of it that carries the apples or the grapes or the olives or the whatever other kinds of fruit grow on branches. That's the picture that they have here. And so Jesus says he is the branch that we have to be connected to, or he's the vine that we have to be connected to, if we want to be fruitful, if we want to see our neighborhood change, if we want to see our neighbors follow the way of Jesus, even if we want to see life change happen in our life, the source of that is not our activity, but rather our abiding. Now, what does abiding mean? Let me just give you a couple of ways that this word can be translated. Abiding means to remain, to rest, to stay, to hang out, to trust. These are all words that are very hard for us to do. I love activity. I will fill my calendar with activity. But when Jesus says abide, he's saying slow down and be. And that is how we are fruitful. And that feels completely backwards to me and to the world that we live in. It feels counterintuitive. What he's saying is that to reach people, we must rest. To grow, we must say no to some things. Right? To get somewhere, we have to slow down. Mm -mm. That's not how I like living. I am very busy, right? He's saying the greatest threat to the life and growth of our church is not the latest cultural trend or the political scandal or the shifting attendance of church in our community, but rather the things that pull us away from resting in his love. Those are the greatest threats to our life with Jesus. Those are the greatest threats to us being a neighborhood church, are the things that pull us away from resting in him. Now look at verse 7 real quick. He says this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Like, what if Jesus meant that? You think about that? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you? And then he goes and he says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You see, the reality is Jesus wants you and our church to be far more fruitful than you and I want. 
He wants our church to be fruitful. He wants your life to be fruitful. He wants you to reach your neighbors. He wants us to be a healthy, thriving, vibrant church. And he is going to do it. That's what he's saying. God's the one who does this. Our work is simply to abide, to stay in his love. Right? And that's really hard for us to do. Right? And then, but this is really important, right? Because the reality is, right, the things that we do as a church, it might look like growth, but it might just be really good marketing. You ever think about that? Like, we, maybe we just, we're just, this is a really cool thing, and lots of people are coming in because they're curious, right? It just might be marketing. It might actually be the, not be the growth that God wants. It might look like evangelism, but it might actually just be people-pleasing and manipulation. It might look like outreach to our community, but it might actually be toxic charity. You see, the true growth that Jesus wants in us is the growth that comes from abiding in his love. And he is abundantly clear that apart from resting in his love, our efforts to reach others, our efforts to change our life, our efforts to connect with our neighbors will be unfruitful. He uses this picture of a branch that's disconnected, right? That branch exists, but it's dry. It's withered. It's going to burn up really quick. It's not going to last. But the true lasting life that Jesus wants for us comes from abiding. You see, in his way, there's not a disconnect between action and contemplation or between our interior lives and our exterior mission. These two things go hand in hand. Oftentimes we think, okay, I have to abide and so I do nothing or I do everything and so therefore I don't abide. These things go hand in hand in the way of Jesus. And so if we want to be a neighbor of a church that invites others into the love and the community of Jesus, we have to be a church that is deeply rooted in his love. And from out of this love, then we serve, then we give, then we care, then we offer hope. And so if that's the greatest threat, then the greatest challenges, the greatest things that are going to pull us away are going to be some things like busyness. Right? Like, like the greatest threats to our abiding might be our schedules. Because you know the busier you are, man, the more mean you are, the more impatient you are, right? the, the less attentive you are. Six in ten Americans, I read this this past week, uh, are too busy to enjoy life. What do you, I mean, what are we doing? If we're too busy to enjoy life, what is our life? Our life is activity, our life is busyness, our life is going. And we're so busy and we're so going that we aren't enjoying the 24 hours in a day that we have. But the reality is we equate being busy with being successful and being important. I've actually done studies on this. That the busier I am, the more successful I feel, the more important I feel, and the more successful other people perceive me to be. It's actually a verified fact that that happens. That when someone says I'm busy, what I think is, oh, you're important. And so we, we adopt this mentality that, that to be fruitful is to be busy. To be important in God's economy is to be full of activity when Jesus says we have to abide. And we translate this into the spiritual life too. Right? That, that to be a good, fruitful follower of Jesus means that my calendar is full with every spiritual and religious activity that I could put in it. That to be a fruitful follower of Jesus means I have to add things to my schedule. And maybe abiding means I have to cut some things out of my schedule. Because busyness is going to keep me going. It's going to keep me rushing. It's not going to keep me remaining. So the greatest threat to our life as a church might be our busyness or our schedule. But underneath that is distraction. Right? Distraction. The average screen time in America, two hours and 31 minutes on social media a day. That's just social media. The actual stats are like seven hours in front of a screen, but some of that counts as work, but we all know you're just Facebooking or whatever. <laughs> but like my screen is constantly clamoring for my attention, right? And if you're like a millennial or younger, that maybe you've been on kind of that, that doom scrolling, they call it, right? Where you're just flipping through video after video after video, and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that was like two hours. Right, screens and noise are clamoring for our attention. Someone described the economy that we live in as an attention economy. 
That, that your attention, the split second that you can give to something on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, that's money to companies. And so the whole scheme of the world around us is to keep our attention somewhere else and to keep us busy. But the reality is, don't you do this, I do this. I have a busy day, and what do I do? I come home and I fill it with distraction. I'm like, that was a busy day. You know what? I deserve like two hours on, on TikTok. I deserve two hours in front of Netflix, right? This is how this loop works, is we're busy, we're busy, we're busy, and so I'm tired, and so what do I do then? I just fill my day, or I fill my evening, or I fill my weekend with distractions. John Mark Homer, in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which if you ever read it, it's a really good book, just it will ruin your life. <laughs> he said... What you give your attention to is the person you become. There's a whole other quote there, but we can just stop there, right? He says, put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul, and what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you give your attention to. That bodes well for those apprentices of Jesus who give the bulk of their attention to him and to all that is good, beautiful, and true in this world, but not for those who give their attention to the 24-7 news cycle of outrage and anxiety and emotion-charged drama are the nonstop feed of celebrity gossip and cultural drivel. We become what we give our attention to, for better or worse. I don't know about you, I get my screen time, like, stat on my iPhone on Sundays at, like, 9 o'clock a.m. And it's like, okay, Jesus, what am I going to pay attention to today? What am I going to pay attention to? Because if we're honest... Sometimes we even use religious and spiritual things to distract us. Or in the language of emotionally healthy spirituality, we use God to run from God. And so I fill my day or my night or my weekend with religious or spiritual activity of a book or a podcast or, or a Bible study, all good things, but sometimes if we're honest, they're actually just more activity that keep us from abiding. Because the reality is what we are really afraid of is we're afraid of doing nothing. Right. Underneath all this is anxiety. Anxiety. I'm afraid of what will happen if I stop. Like, what if I just stopped? What if I just didn't rush around? What if I had an empty day on my calendar? What would happen if I stepped out of the rat race and I rested? You see, psychologists are discovering that there's a feedback loop between busyness, distraction, and anxiety. I'm busy, and so then when I'm finally resting, I distract myself. And my distractions then keep me up here, and so my anxiety spikes, and so I have less capacity to deal with my busyness. And so my busyness then just continues. This is the cycle that we all live in. Busyness, distraction, anxiety. But Jesus says only if we abide will we be fruitful. Only if we remain will we actually see the life that he wants for us. See, what could be a better picture of the gospel of grace, which says that your belonging is not based on your performance, than a community that truly rests in the love of Jesus? A community that is rested and, and lives a life together that is paced and that is rooted in what Jesus has done for us. A community that gives out of the love that Jesus has given to us. You see, we are inviting people into a distinct way of life in our world. A way of life that is not marked by productivity or anxiety or stress, but by resting in a love that is complete for us in Jesus. That's what we're inviting people into. And so what we need as a neighborhood church is a way to resist the cycle of busyness, distraction, and anxiety that is playing around us, and if we're honest, in us, six days of the week. Sometimes seven, if we're honest. Sometimes all but two hours, maybe, on a Sunday morning. We need a way to resist this formation, to resist this flow. This is the, the narrative, and this is the, 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 the trajectory of our life six days out of the week. We need a way to resist that formation, because that is doing something in us every day of the week. Now, the reality is this will not come naturally to us. Right? It is a skill or a practice that we must learn. 
And so the reality is like any practice or like any skill, it will take some intentionality. And so what, what Christians have done at various points throughout history, particularly moments of stress or disillusionment or major cultural shifts, is they've banded together and formed what they call a community rule of life. It's not a set of rules that we have to do, but it's a, a simple way, an intentional plan, to live in love of Jesus every day. It's a plan, it's a way to think about, okay, this day, I'm gonna be, my day's going to be full of busyness and distraction and anxiety, but if Jesus says that I need to abide, and he says, if my words abide in you and I abide in you, then you will bear much fruit, then what I need today is I need a plan to resist the formation of busyness, distraction, and anxiety so that I can rest in the love of Jesus. Uh, the way that I like to think about a rule of life is it's like riding a bicycle. Uh, when you first, I don't know how many of you remember when you first started riding a bike. Maybe some of you are like, I have never learned how to ride a bike. But when you first start learning to ride a bike, it is very unnatural. Right? It, it, it's very wobbly. And so what we have created are training wheels. And training wheels, you can see it right there, uh, they're there not to ride on the training wheels but to help you develop an internal sense of balance. Right? That's what you need to ride a bike. You need an internal sense of balance, an internal sense of like, I'm leaning this way, and so all the like, micro muscles in my abs, right, which I don't have, like, move that direction. Right? That's, that's, what I, that's how you learn how to ride a bike. And so training wheels keep you from falling off. In the same way, a rule of life is like a set of training wheels. The goal is not to do the rule of life or to, to follow the plan. The goal is that we would each develop an internal sense of the abiding love of Jesus in our life. That I would begin to develop this sense that inside, in my heart, through the Spirit of God, like the love of God is enough. God's presence in my life is enough. And he is with me and he is for me because of what he did for me on the cross of Christ. To abide in him. And so a rule of life, an intentional plan to say, how am I going to follow Jesus in this season? The goal is not to have a long list of things to do. It is instead to say, this is the training wheels. And so it helps me then position myself so that I know the love of God. Let me just give you an example of this, right? So like I've had a rule of life for a couple of years now. And on my rule of life, uh, under, under pace uh, is Sabbath, right? Like part of following Jesus is I, I just need to step out. I need to unplug. And, and since having a newborn, that is like impossible. Or at least we're figuring it out right now. And so my rule of life, it's kind of like for the past couple months, I've been riding on the, the training wheel, right? Like I haven't fully completed, but I'm like riding on the training wheel. And my rule of life is telling me, hey, look, like you, we need to figure this out. Right? Not so that I can follow some rule to get God to love me, but because the love of God invites me to rest. And so a rule of life functions like that. It's not that I need to do the thing or ride the training wheel. It's instead that the love of God is, is inviting me to abide. And the world around me is trying to push me off the bike. It's trying to push me out of the love of Jesus. And so I need a way to say, when that happens, when busyness and distraction and anxiety come, what is going to keep me in the center of God's love? My rule of life is that. It's a simple, intentional plan to say on this day, when I know I'm going to be deformed by all these things, how am I going to rest in the love of Jesus? And so we've been over the past year uh, rolling out and introducing and talking about a rule of life for our community. A way that we can band together to do this together. Uh, not that we all follow the same plan, that you do the same thing. I'm not going to tell you all the things that you need to do, but instead to say the life of Jesus and the love of Jesus looks like this. And so now, what does it look like for you to follow him in that way? It's on the back wall as you walked in. Maybe it's already become white noise for you. But I just want to walk through how this works for you. And then we have a practice guide this morning that's going to give you real simple ways to begin to do this in your life. So our rule of life begins with this five-segmented heart. And this comes from Jesus' teaching when he was asked, what's the most important thing I can do? He didn't say go to a Bible study. He didn't say attend church. What did he say? Love. God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so to capture this idea, to help this stick in our heads, right, we have this five-segmented heart that picture each one of those five parts of us. The first S, that, oh, go back one slide. The first S is my social life. When he says, love my neighbor, right, how am I loving my neighbor? How am I loving my spouse? How am I loving my kids? Right, my social life is part of how I follow Jesus. P 
stands for my physical life, which is my body. Right? How am I following Jesus with my body and my sexuality? How am I following Jesus with my abilities, uh, my ability to enact change, my money? All these things are part of my physical life. Uh, that center eye there is my intellectual life. It's my thoughts about God, myself, and the world around me. Do my thoughts about God, my thoughts about myself, my thoughts about the world line up with God's word? Now, we have a dotted line in this because the reality is that's where most of us stop. Most of us say, okay, I got Christian friends, I go to a Christian group, I do a few Christian practices, a few Christian disciplines, and I have Christian thoughts. But that's not where Jesus wants us to stop. He doesn't just want us to have nice thoughts about us, about him. He wants us to rest in his love. And so beneath that is my emotional, my spiritual life. This is where my anxiety rests. This is where the messages about myself that I believe that run counter to God's word live in my emotions and in my spiritual life. And so this is designed to remind us that Jesus doesn't just want my thoughts about him. He wants my whole heart. He wants every part of me, including my interior life. And so we start here from this place of love because Jesus said what he wants from us is love, not our activity. And so how am I loving God this week? How am I loving him this morning with all these parts of me? And then from that are six practices from Jesus' life. Three practices of loving God and three practices of loving your neighbor. These come from Jesus' life. If you read through how he lived his life and the things that he taught, you'll find each one of these in his way of life. The three practices of loving God are prayer, where I turn my attention to God and seek his will in my life. Practices where I actually do the things that Jesus did. Jesus read scripture, and so I read scripture. Jesus fasted, and so I fast. Jesus practiced solitude, and so I practiced solitude. What did he do? And so what do I need to do? And the practice of pace is slowing down and resting, practicing things like Sabbath. These are all things that Jesus did, how he lived his life. And so for us to do what he did and to rest in his love is to take up his way of life. The second set of practices are then how I love my neighbor. The practice of people, Jesus lived life in community. And so who are the people that you need in your life in this season of life? The two or three or four or 12 people that you need to commit to walk with in this next season. The practice of peacemaking. Jesus taught us to love our enemies. And I think he meant it. To actually seek reconciliation in my own life, in my community, in the world around us. And then the practice of place, which is what this whole series is about. Where has God placed you? At your address, or in your office, or in your family, or, or wherever. And how does he want to use that in order to invite other people in that place to follow him? And so the idea of this rule of life is, is a way to say, look, uh, how, this is how Jesus lived his life. But how, do, how does he want you to follow him this, in this season? Like, what does pace look like for you? Because pace for me looked like something before our son was born, and it has to look like something now different after he is born, just like you're in a season of life right now that's different than mine. And you have a, a journey with Jesus and a story that requires a certain approach to following him, but this is the framework for how Jesus lived his life. And so now we together follow him in this way. And as we do this, right, the, the reality is the world's going to push against that and say, well, no, you need to be formed in this way. Or you need to be busy, or you need to be distracted, or you need to do these things. And this is a way to say, okay, this is what Jesus calls me to do. How I want to live my life. To abide and to rest in his love. Because the reality is, if we're a neighborhood church, what is it that we are offering to people? What is it that we are offering to people? Jesus said this in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, which if you do my life, you will abide in me just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And here it is. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. What we are offering the world is joy. Like, does joy mark your life right now? Like, joy is not a matter of like, I'm happy right now and things are going well. Joy is like, no matter what happens, 
I know that God's love for me is secure. I know that my circumstances could be terrible. I know that my bank account could be empty, but I know that God's love for me is secure, that his joy rests in me. And the, the way I've been thinking about this this past week, if, if a rule of life is a set of training wheels to help us learn to ride a bike, then joy looks like that. Joy looks like I am, I am riding the bike, my, my arms are out, I don't have to think about it, I am simply riding, I have never achieved this level of joy. The closest that I have come is I get one hand off the bike, the bike handles, just enough so I can like take a selfie and then I put it back on, right? And the same thing is true in my spiritual life with Jesus too, right? Like I have not yet achieved in my journey with Jesus the freedom of saying, no matter what my circumstances, I know the joy of God. No matter what I'm dealing with, I know that God, like, like when things get hard and when things get busy and things get full of stress and anxiety, I, I still feel I'm holding on to the handlebars. I'm riding the training wheels. But Jesus says, as you abide in me, the life he wants for us is a life in which our hands are open. I'm not clinging to the handlebars, worried that God's love for me is secure. It is secure. How do I know that? Because I've been riding the bike. I've been learning how to ride the training wheels. I've been learning how to live the life that Jesus calls me to live. And he then brings fruit out of my life that says, no matter what my circumstances are or the difficult things that I'm facing, I have joy. And that's what people need to see. That's what people need to be invited into. That's the neighborhood church that people are like, all those folks over there, they're weird. Life is hard and difficult. They don't have everything together, but their hands are up. And they're riding in the love of God. I want some of that. That's how we become a fruitful neighborhood church. As we learn to ride the bike with Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that your heart for us is joy that a fruitful church, that a fruitful life in you is not a matter of us grinning and bearing it and clenching our fists and saying, I can do this. But it is instead about trusting you, trusting your love, about, about walking in a way in which you will bring life and joy and love in us and through us. So this morning, guys, we consider what it looks like to walk your way with our neighbors, to walk your way in our neighborhood. God, would you show us the ways in which we've been deformed by busyness and distraction and anxiety? Would you show us the way of walking in your love? God, for the one who's here this morning, feels like they have to do a bunch of things in order to get you to love them. Would you show them what you've done in Jesus? That you have love that is secure. We don't have to earn it or perform for it, but we simply are invited to rest in it. Jesus, thank you for that love. May we walk in it and ride in it this week. Pray this in his name. Amen.